The Vampire of Hanover was a horrifying German serial killer that would lure away young boys and then give them his love bite, which meant he would try and rip out their throat with his teeth. And due to his police connections, the Vampire of Hanover got away with it for far too long. So today's video is going to be another solved true crime case on the Butcher of Hanover, the Vampire of Hanover. Actually, this man, this serial killer has so many different nicknames. He's also known as the Wolfman, the Windpipe Muncher, so many different nicknames. But before we get into this case, I do just wanna thank our sponsors for making this video possible, NordPass. If you're one of those people that uses Facebook to log into other different websites, then listen up. And even if you're not, listen up. I think everyone can benefit from this. But specifically those Facebook people, have you ever wondered what might happen if your Facebook account got hacked? That means everything else is getting hacked too. And your credit card information, your delivery address, all that kind of stuff, is out there now. Well, the cybersecurity experts that created NordVPN that we know and love on this channel, they have a solution. And I think everyone can benefit from this. And that is NordPass. NordPass is a password manager and cybersecurity tool that will make your life easier on so many different levels. It means that you can store all your different passwords easily and most importantly, securely, all in one place so that you don't have to memorize a password ever again. Recent studies found that women are less likely to create a new unique password for each new unique account that they make, which would obviously be the safer thing to do, but I suppose we can't really be bothered learning and memorizing all the different passwords, which is where NordPass comes in. And it will also help with your online shopping as well. You can store your credit card information, your delivery details, all that kind of stuff, again, securely. It makes everything so much quicker, so much easier, especially with their autofill feature, which means you barely even have to type anything. It like fills it all out for you. And you can sync it across six different devices as well. So you can have it on your phone, on your laptop, on your iPad, maybe like your work phone or laptop, I don't know, whatever you've got, you can use NordPass. And don't worry, like I keep saying, it's all very safe, very secure. No one else can see the data that you have encrypted in your account. And they also have this really cool feature called the data breach scanner that allows you to quickly find out if any of your information has been leaked online at all. It can identify where it happened, when it happened, and exactly what data was compromised so that you can then deal with that accordingly. And NordPass are very kindly offering you guys an exclusive deal plus an additional month free when you go through the link down below in the description. That's nordpass.com forward slash Eleanor and use the code Eleanor at checkout. Thanks again to NordPass for sponsoring this video. Now before we get into it, I do just want to give my usual disclaimer that I mean absolutely no disrespect to anyone that I talk about in this video. This video is for educational purposes and everything that I'm about to say is just information that I have found on the internet and I'm compiling into one video. There are some very heavy content warnings for this case, including abuse, paedophilia, sexual assault, rape, descriptions of gore and dismemberment. So if any of that is something that you feel like you can't watch right now, that's totally fine. Click out of the video. Hopefully I'll get to see you again some other time. But all that being said, let's get into the case. So today's case takes place in Hanover in Germany in the 1910s and 1920s. But first, let's take it back to when our serial killer Fritz Harman was first born. His full birth name was Friedrich Heinrich Karl Harman, although he went by Fritz, and he was born on October 25th, 1879. He was the youngest of six children to a rather privileged, wealthy family. Although just because his family had money didn't mean that his his upbringing and his childhood was all that rosy. His father, Ollie, was just a straight up horrible guy. He had the nickname in that area, Sulky Ollie, because he just had the worst temper, the worst attitude. He was verbally abusive towards his family. He would cheat on Fritz's mother all the time, who, by the way, the mother was chronically ill. She was bed bound for most of her life. I don't know what she was chronically ill with, but she was really, really struggling to be a mother and then to be a wife to 
this awful man who's just always verbally abusing her, cheating on her, getting drunk, coming home, shouting at her. And so for all these different reasons, Fritz and his five siblings didn't really get that much love or attention from their parents growing up. Their father just didn't have time for them, didn't care for them, and their mother was physically unable. And so Fritz actually became quite a social recluse in his childhood. He didn't really have any friends. He didn't socialize with anyone that wasn't his siblings, really. And from a very young age, he was very disinterested in all the very typical boyish activities like sports and other, other boy things. Instead, he much preferred playing with his sisters and their dolls and dressing up in their outfits and stuff like that and his parents would punish him for this. They told him that he needed to be more like the other boys, more like his brothers. And I think this actually largely contributed to why he was such a social recluse. He had no interest in playing with the other boys and doing what the other boys were doing, like at school and in the neighborhood. He didn't care for any of that. He wanted to play with the girls, but his parents wouldn't let him and so he decided to just not play with anyone. And then when he was eight years old, something very traumatic happened to Fritz Harmon when he was at school. He was molested by one of his teachers and he never told a single soul about this. He just suffered in silence. He kept having to go back into that class, see his abuser every single day and no one knew that this had happened. And this really, really affected him. His grades started plummeting. He was doing really bad in school. And at the time, everyone just thought he was being lazy and he wasn't trying. But of course it was because he was dealing with all of this trauma. He ended up having to resit a couple of school years because his grades were so bad. But in the end, he ended up dropping out of school early anyway at the age of 15 to go and join the military. And this was something that Fritz Harmon was very passionate about. He really enjoyed his time in the military, his, well, his training anyway. It didn't actually last that long, however, because just a few months into this training, something happened. One day, Fritz just collapsed to the ground and started having a fit. And so he was taken and he was like examined by the medical professionals and they found that he'd given himself a concussion and left himself with long lasting epileptic fits. For the rest of his life, he would suffer with these fits. And actually this all affected his position in the army. He could no longer perform as well as he once had because he was having fits nearly every single day. And so he had to be discharged and go back home. So he's 16 years old now, he's back home and he feels like his life is over before it's even began. He found his dream job and he was having so much fun for a couple of months and then all of that was taken away from him. And so when he got back home, his father, luckily his father owned a cigar factory and he was able to give his son a job there. And I mean, it was enough to keep him afloat. It was enough to give him some money, but he really didn't enjoy it there. He wasn't passionate about working in a factory. And so Fritz Harmon started thinking of other ways that he could get some excitement and some entertainment in his life. And it was around this time that he started committing crimes. And it wasn't the usual story where these criminals will start small and their crimes would just escalate and get worse over the years. No, Fritz Harmon was straight in at the deep end because at 16 years old, he started sexually assaulting young boys. He would lure these boys off of the street into like hidden isolated spots. In fact, it was more often than not the basement of the cigar factory that he worked at where this would take place. So he would lure these boys in and sexually abuse them. And I don't know how often he did this, but I know it was regular until eventually he was caught, arrested and sent to a psychiatric hospital not prison, a psychiatric hospital. Because back then in the 1800s, the main issue that people would have had with this whole situation would have been more so about the homosexuality than it would have been him literally raping and abusing children. How disgusting is that? So instead of him being thrown in prison for his crimes, he was thrown in a psychiatric hospital for his sexuality. That was the main thing that the justice system cared about. So he was sent to this psychiatric hospital because he was deemed mentally ill for his sexuality. And while he was there, he was diagnosed as being incurably deranged. So the plan was that he was gonna be in this psychiatric hospital indefinitely. It could have been for the rest of his life. It was definitely gonna be years and years and years, but it wasn't. 
because he managed to escape after just seven months in that hospital with the help of his mother. His mother helped him break out of this hospital and then fled with him to Switzerland. And not much is known about their time in Switzerland, obviously, because they were laying low. They, they didn't want to draw attention to themselves. I think they stayed with a family member over there and they picked up a couple of like manual labor jobs so that they could earn some money while they were there. And then they ended up returning to Hanover about a year and a half later. When he returned to Hanover, Fritz Harmon met a woman named Erna Lowett and he very quickly got her pregnant, like very, very quickly. And they were like, well, Looks like we gotta get married now. And so they did, they got engaged. But before they could actually get to the wedding part, Fritz Harmon was summoned for his compulsory military service. He was drafted out to war. He was out there for about two years and he was doing well. I don't think his fits were that much of an issue for him at this point in time. And actually he had a great time. He always described this point in his life as the best years of his life because he was really passionate about the military. He just couldn't do it because of his like physical illnesses. However, while he was out there with the military, he got the news that his mother had fallen seriously ill. And this put him into like a major depression, knowing that he couldn't be there with her and, and support her. And I think the stress of this situation really like kicked back in his epilepsy. I think maybe it triggered it and he started having all these fits again and he was deemed unfit for military service and he was sent back home. So he's back in Hanover and he needs a job now because I mean, he's got a family to provide for. He's got a wife, he's got a kid. So he goes back to work at his father's cigar factory and quickly the two of them, him and his dad, become sworn enemies. I don't really know what was going on. I don't know the ins and outs of this, but they were fighting every single day. There were lawsuits involved. They were trying to sue each other. This was so deep. It was a huge thing. They were like giving each other death threats, threatening to kill each other. And the dad was actually hell bent on getting Fritz Harmon sent back to a psychiatric hospital. He wanted him like, sectioned forever. I don't really know how all that resolved, but that was quite a big thing in Fritz Harman's life for quite a while. And on top of that, his marriage was also in turmoil at this point. At this point in the case, he's about 25 years old um, and his wife starts accusing him of having affairs outside of their marriage, which let's be honest, this was the early 1900s and pretty much every single married man was having an affair outside of their marriage. That was kind of the norm, but especially for Fritz Harmon because he was not into women. I don't know how he ended up with Erna, but he would say for the rest of his life that he was a homosexual and he was not interested in women. I don't know how he found this woman. I don't know how he got her pregnant. I don't know why, but yeah, he was seeing other men all the, all the way throughout his marriage to this woman. And she ended up divorcing him or like calling off the engagement. I don't know if they ever ended up getting married and she kicked him out of the house. So now Fritz Harmon is out on the street, he's got no job, he's got no money, and he is desperate. And so he falls into a life of crime. I mean, he did try and make money in an honest, legitimate way. He would like pick up random manual labor jobs, but he would lose them very quickly. And so the main way that he made money throughout his twenties was stealing and scamming and robbing, burglaring. He was a con man. He tried anything that just was not getting an honest job. He would get caught for these different things here and there. He would get thrown in prison for a few months at a time, but nothing ever really deterred him from continuing this criminal streak. He even started a scheme around this time, just, just another crime to add to the pile, um, where him and this woman that he met, they would sneak off to graveyards and cemeteries on a night and literally grave rob bodies and then sell the bodies to like shady people that I don't know why want the why they wanted human bodies, but they did. In 1913, so Fritz Harman is in his mid 30s at this point. He gets caught burgling a house, which is something he did often, but he didn't often get caught. This was like one of the first times he'd properly gotten caught in like a serious crime of his. And all of a sudden his whole criminal past comes to bite him in the ass. Because of this one burglary that he was caught for, police had to go to Fritz Harmon's house and search the whole thing to see if they could find all the, all the items that he stole. And when they did, they ended up finding so many more stolen items that they could connect to like 10 other home burglaries. 
So he'd been caught for everything all at once. So he was charged for all these different burglaries and he was sentenced to five years in prison. And this is one of the longest sentences he'd had ever. And this actually coincided with the kickoff of World War One. And obviously when the World Wars happened, the countries needed like every single man that they could get to go either go out and fight or at least work for the war in, in some kind of capacity. Obviously Fritz Harman could not be sent out to war to fight because of his fits and things like that, but they still needed him, I don't know, doing something. And so instead of spending his days in prison, towards the end of his sentence, he was allowed to go out and work in the factories to like make bullets or whatever. So his sentence was essentially kind of cut short in that he was allowed out and about now and he just had to go back home to sleep in his prison cell on a night but then he'd be back out the next day. So it was hardly a prison sentence. And then eventually when he was released, he just fell back into a life of crime, burglary and robbing, conning, scamming. But this time, now that he was out of prison, he was actually taking this quite seriously in that he wanted to be a career criminal, like a proper like professional criminal, not just like some scammy little guy on the streets. He was making connections. He was making a name and a reputation for himself. And it was around this time as well that Fritz Harman decided it would be quite a good idea for him and his criminal career if he was to get on police's good side, if he was to make some friends on the police force. Because that way, if he was to get caught for any of these crimes, it'd be his mates catching him for it. And so they'd probably let him off or at the very least they would give him like a lesser punishment for whatever he'd done. So he started making these friendships and in order to get on police's good side, Fritz Harman decided to become an informant, a snitch. He had a lot of information to offer police because like I said, he had a lot of criminal friends now. He was making a lot of connections. He had a lot of inside information and he would go and feed that to the police so that the police would like him. But obviously this was kind of risky business because he couldn't let his criminal friends know that he was feeding the information to police. So Fritz Harman and the police came up with a formula of how they were gonna do this. So most of his friends were robbers, burglars, you know, most of their crimes involved like stolen property or stolen money. And so Fritz Harman would volunteer to his friends to keep hold of those stolen items for them just in case they got raided by police after the after the big heists that they would do. And they're thinking, oh wow, Fritz Harman's a really good friend, you know, keeping all my stolen property at his house. So Fritz would take all of these stolen items and then he would get in contact with police and be like, I've got it all. And so police would actually raid Fritz Harman's house, find all this stolen stuff, arrest Fritz Harman and all of his friends. So then it didn't look like he was ratting them out, it looked like he was getting in trouble for it too. But eventually after all of the questionings and stuff, police would find out whose stolen items those were and they would end up letting Fritz Harman go because they knew that he was innocent in this and they just wanted the stuff and they just wanted to capture his friends. So now Fritz Harman has a great relationship with his local police and he has this like newfound confidence when it comes to committing his crimes. He knows he can get away with more and more and so he starts committing worse and worse crimes until he committed his very first murder. On September 25th, 1918, Fritz Harman is about 40 years old at this point. He was 40 when he started his killing spree. And he was just at Hanover train station one day when he noticed this young boy who looked quite scruffy and tired and unkempt. It was clear that this boy was probably sleeping rough on the streets. So Harmon approaches this boy and he asks him what he's doing there, what his situation is. And he learns that this boy has run away from home. And so yeah, now he is sleeping on the streets. He was a 17 year old boy named Friedel Roth. So Fritz Harmon saw an opportunity here. I don't know if it was murder exactly that was on his mind. I don't know if he immediately saw this boy and thought I wanna murder him but he certainly wanted to sexually abuse him as he had with so many other young boys all his life. And so he took this opportunity. Harmon offered to take this boy back to his house so that he could wash up, he could have a place to stay, he could have some food. And of course this boy Friedel was so grateful. So the two men left the train station and Friedel Roth was never seen again. After a few days, a couple of his friends reported him missing because I think he'd actually run away from home with 
with a few people and they'd seen him speaking with Fritz Harmon in the train station. And so actually they were able to tell police, we saw him speaking with this older guy before he went missing. So police went straight to Fritz Harmon's house. They knocked on the door and he didn't answer. They actually put their ear to the door and they heard noise inside. So they did what they had to do. They knocked down that door and when they got inside, Fritz Harmon was there with a completely different young boy and Friedel Roth was nowhere to be seen. Yeah, he was laid in bed naked with a 13 year old boy. And so immediately police arrested him. They had no idea where Friedel Roth was, but I mean, this was clearly a crime. But because Fritz Harmon was so buddy-buddy with the police, he actually never saw any prison time or any charges for this with this 13 year old boy. And I think this whole thing of him being caught in bed with a, a child completely distracted people from why they were there in the first place to find Friedel Roth. And so he was never found. Fritz Harmon got away with both kidnapping Friedel Roth and whatever he was doing with this 13 year old boy. Police just kind of forgot about it at the time, but now we know that Friedel Roth was Fritz Harmon's first ever murder victim. When he took him back to the apartment that night that he picked him up from the train station, Fritz Harmon proceeded to rape Friedel and he actually tried to murder him as he was raping him. This was something he did often. He, he tried to do both at once. And he had a particular technique that we mentioned in the beginning of this video that he would call his love bite, where he would try and bite out these boys' Adam's apples from their throat, like literally try and rip it out with his teeth, which is of course how he earned the serial killer nickname, the Vampire of Hanover. And he would be successful with this in, in a few of his victims, but actually half the time, he would end up just asphyxiating them anyway, like with his hand on their neck as he's trying to bite them out, he would just end up strangling them instead. But yeah, a lot of the time he would successfully bite through the neck, bite through like the veins and the arteries and the boy or the young man would end up just bleeding out. And once Fritz Harmon had murdered his victim, he would then proceed to dismember their whole body, chop them up into tiny pieces, and we'll get more into his exact process towards the end of the video. But with this particular case, he actually decapitated Friedel Roth and then kept his head for, well, I don't know how long, but for quite a while, a good few weeks at least. In fact, he said it was still in the apartment when police came and found him in bed with that 13 year old boy when they were looking for Friedel. He'd actually wrapped up Friedel's head in newspaper and then hidden it behind his stove. But it was never found and Fritz Harmon wasn't charged with a single thing. So he was still out on the street as a free man, just in time to meet another young boy at the train station. This time it was a young boy named Hans Granz. Hans was about 18 years old and he was in pretty much the exact same situation as Friedel Roth had been. He was a runaway, he was sleeping out on the street, he had no money, no food, and Fritz Harmon approached him and offered him all of that. But this interaction ended quite differently to the first one. The two men went back to Fritz Harmon's house and they actually had consensual sex. In fact, I think Fritz Harmon paid Hans Granz and he stayed there at Harmon's apartment with him for a few days. And over that period of time, Fritz Harmon found himself falling for Hans Granz. He liked him. He didn't want to murder him the way that he'd murdered Friedel. And this was a mutually beneficial relationship for both of these men. Fritz Harmon was in love with Hans Granz and he got his kind of like relationship satisfaction and Hans Granz got somewhere to stay, he got money, he got shelter, he got food. So the now 41 year old Fritz Harmon is in a relationship with this 18 year old boy and it can hardly be called a relationship, I suppose. And a lot of sources say that this relationship was a very turbulent one. Apparently, Hans Granz was quite a manipulative, mean partner to Fritz Harmon. He would make fun of him, he would mock him, manipulate him, verbally abuse him, 
But apparently Fritz Harman would just accept it all because he really liked Hans Granz. I don't know if Harman was mutually abusive back to Hans Granz. I mean, maybe, but we don't know that. But whatever the situation was, the two men stayed in this relationship for years to come because like I say, it was mutually beneficial. They're both getting something out of it, even though it's different things. But throughout the years, they would get into some seriously heated arguments. Like Fritz Harman would even throw Hans Granz out on the street and like kick him out of the house and obviously he had nowhere to go nowhere to stay no money nothing and then Harmon would later like go out on the street and try and find him and beg for him back obviously because he was in love with him or whatever and he wanted him back and Hans Grant would come back every single time because he needed somewhere to stay. So I suppose, yeah, both men were pretty abusive. If Hans Granz is being manipulative and verbally abusive towards Fritz Harman, but then the second this happens, Fritz Harman is kicking him out on the street knowing that he has nowhere to go and that he's gonna be homeless, that sounds like an awful relationship on both sides. And in fact, as all of this case came out in the coming years, Hans Granz would tell police that he wasn't even gay. He wasn't even interested in men. He literally just put up with Fritz Harman's sexual advances towards him in order to get the shelter and the food and the money. In fact, Hans Granz would have other girlfriends the whole time that he was with Fritz Harman. He would be seeing other women, going out, sleeping with women, and then he would come home back to Fritz. But yeah, over the years, the two of them kind of became like criminal accomplices. Obviously that's how Fritz Harman made all of his money and now he needed to make enough money for both him and Hans Granz. So they would kind of work together, stealing, scamming, conning people. But on the side of all of that, Fritz Harman was still committing much worse crimes. The murders continued. I think he did intend on Hans Granz becoming his second murder victim, but obviously then the feelings got in the way. He decided he didn't want to kill him. And so he had to go out back to the train station to find a new second murder victim. Before I do get into the rest of Fritz Harman's victims, I do just have to say that the details in this case are quite vague, obviously because it's so old, over a hundred years old is this case. And at the time there wouldn't have been proper documentation in the first place, but obviously over a hundred years, things get lost. And that means that we're gonna have to be quite vague about each individual victim. I don't have most of their names. I don't have most of their stories. I don't have just in general, a lot of information about them. And especially because Fritz Harman used to go for a very particular victim type, you know, vulnerable people, whether that was runaways or homeless people or sex workers, like for whatever reason, there wasn't a lot of documentation on these people. His usual victim type was like late teens, boys in their late teens, although his youngest victim was 10 years old and his oldest victim was 22 years old. So that was the general, uh, age range we're looking at, but yeah, like I said, they were mainly like 17, 18. And he would use pretty much the exact same tactic every single time. He would pick out these vulnerable people that obviously needed food, money, shelter, warmth, and he would offer them all of that in order to lure them back to his apartment where he would rape, murder, and dismember them every single one. His killing spree lasted for six long years. And in that time, he claimed at least 27 victims that we know of. Although it's believed that there's many, many more victims. A lot of sources even think it's up in the 50s. Some even say up in the 70s. But like I said, we only know about 27 cases for sure. So let's talk about those specific cases that we do know. Fritz Harman's second murder victim was a 17 year old boy named Fritz Frank, who again, he met at the train station. That was usually where he would meet his victims. And he brought Fritz Frank back to his apartment where Hans Granz was just chilling and he saw this guy. Actually, at the time when Harmon brought Fritz Frank back, Hans Granz had a girlfriend of, uh, I don't know what this relationship was with Fritz Harmon, that he would just let him have other girlfriends and bring them back to the house, but whatever, he had this girl around. But anyway, Harmon took his new victim back into his bedroom while Hans Granz and his girlfriend stayed in the living room and Hans turned to this girlfriend and whispered, he's gonna get trampled on today. So Hans Granz, knew what Fritz Harman was about to do to that young boy. And obviously Hans knew that Harman would want some privacy and alone time in order to 
to rape and murder this boy. And so Hans Granz and his girlfriend went out for the night. But actually, Hans ended up coming back a little bit too early the next morning because as soon as he walked in the apartment, he saw this young boy, Fritz Frank, laying naked and unconscious on the bed. And so Hans kind of panicked, realizing that Harmon hadn't finished what he was doing. And he turned to Harmon and he said, oh, what time should I come back? And then he just left. So again, he walked in on this happening, had every chance to stop it, but instead he decided to give Harmon some privacy to do what he was about to do. A few hours later, when Hans Granz and his girlfriend came back a second time, Fritz Harmon told them that his new friend, Fritz Frank, had actually left and moved to Hamburg. Of course, that wasn't true. They all knew it wasn't true. They all knew what had just happened, but they were all just kind of pretending that they didn't know. But really what had happened was Fritz Harmon had raped, murdered and dismembered this young boy and then taken all of his body parts out to a local river and just discarded this 17 year old boy as if he was trash. Over the next few months, three very similar murders took place. One of a 17 year old, a 19 year old, and then a 16 year old. And actually that last one of the 16 year old, he was wearing a yellow raincoat when he went missing and when he was murdered by Fritz Harmon. And for the next few months, Fritz Harmon was seen wearing that yellow raincoat around town. And obviously every person that he interacted with there was no way for them to know that he was stood there wearing his murder victim's clothing. So now Fritz Harmon is officially a serial killer with a kill count of five and he had no plans of slowing down anytime soon. He ended up moving to a new apartment and he very quickly discovered that one of his neighbors had a 13 year old son, just his victim type. And so he set his sights on this new target. This young boy was called Ernst and one day his father sent him out to go and run an errand for him. And Fritz Harmon saw Ernst leaving his house and walking down the street alone and he decided to snatch up this opportunity. He managed to lure this poor boy back into his apartment and he murdered him, raped and murdered and dismembered him just meters away from where his parents were in their family home. And again, he used the exact same MO as pretty much all of his other murders. He tried to bite out this boy's Adam's apple and then he eventually dismembered the body when he was done and threw it in the local river. The boy's parents did report him missing when he didn't return home from running these errands and a search party commenced, like quite a big search party actually, but police found absolutely no leads. There were no traces as to where he could have gone and eventually the search was called off and Fritz Harmon got away with yet another murder. This sixth murder was very quickly followed by a seventh and then an eighth and then a ninth. And actually this ninth murder was the closest that Fritz Harmon had come to being caught so far because he didn't actually kill this ninth boy straight away, which is what he usually did. He would usually meet him at the train station, take him home and kill them literally within a few hours of meeting him, but not this one. This boy was about 17, 18 years old. He got talking to Harmon in the train station and told him that he was looking for a job. And so Fritz Harmon said, oh, I've, I've got a job going at the moment. Come back to my house and we can discuss it. But this boy wasn't so open to going back to this stranger's house with him. And so he said, well, let me go home and discuss it with my parents and then I'll get back in touch with you and we can continue talking about this job. So that's exactly what he did. He went home, told his parents that he'd just met this guy and they were really happy for him that he was about to get this job. And so a couple of days later, he got back in touch with Fritz Harmon, went to go and meet up to talk about this job. And that was when he was murdered. He was raped, murdered, dismembered, and thrown into the river just like all those other boys. But obviously because he'd told his parents that he'd met this guy at the train station and then that was where he was going on the day that he went missing, his parents told that to the police. They said it has to be something to do with this guy. But unfortunately, the parents didn't know Fritz Harmon's name. They couldn't give a name across. And so there really wasn't much that police could do. I mean, they tried to follow this lead, but eventually, it turned into nothing and Fritz Harmon again, got away with it. Two weeks later, Fritz Harmon was back at it again. He was looking for another victim when he found 16 year old Wilhelm on his way home from work. Again, Harmon decided to play the long game here and he made friends with Wilhelm. He didn't try and kill him straight away like he usually did. Instead, he actually decided to introduce himself under a fake name. He introduced himself as Detective Fritz Honnerbrock. 
So he even gave himself a fake job as a detective. The two of them made friends as much as a 40 something year old man can make friends with a 16 year old boy. They made friends and this boy goes back home to his parents, tells them that he's made friends with this detective, da 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 da. And then a few days later, 16 year old Wilhelm goes missing. And when his parents report this to the police, they tell them that he'd just made friends with this older guy that was a detective. They gave over the name, but obviously because it was a fake name, this never led back to Fritz Harmon. And still, he's getting away with it. Fritz Harmon raped, murdered, dismembered this boy. And then the next day, he and Hans Granz both went out together and sold this child's bike. His 11th and 12th murders were actually some of his youngest victims yet. There was a 15 year old boy and a 13 year old boy. And then the 13th murder is again, the closest he's come so far to being caught. This time it was a 17 year old boy named Adolf who had disappeared. And so police went to Hanover train station since that was the last place he was seen. And they were speaking to a bunch of witnesses who said they'd noticed something kind of weird that night. There were two older men, one much older and one probably just like in his 20s, but certainly older than Adolf, that were seen like pointing and talking about Adolf. Later that day, the three of them, so these two older men and Adolf, were all seen walking down the road and then Adolf was never seen or heard from again. And we now know that these two older men were Fritz Harmon and Hans Granz at Hanover train station looking for Harmon's next victim, which was of course 17 year old Adolf. But none of the witnesses at the train station could give any names or anything. They tried to give a description of these two older men, but it never led back to Fritz Harmon. By the end of 1923, Fritz Harmon had claimed 14 different victims and he was not planning on slowing down in the new year because over the next six weeks, he claimed another four. And then after his 18th victim, he suddenly decides to just have a bit of a break, which was kind of out of character for Fritz Harmon. A lot of these murders had been taking place like sometimes just days after each other. It was about one a week. Between a week and 10 days, actually, I'd say these murders were spaced out. But for some reason here, he takes a very uncharacteristic couple of months off. But then when he returns to his killing spree after his couple of months off, he actually decides to take a bit of a different approach because up until now, he'd just been picking up strangers from the train station, killing people literally within a couple of hours of meeting them. He didn't go for people that he already knew, but his first victim back was actually one of his friends. So yeah, he brought this friend back to his house, murdered him. And then over the coming days, obviously all their other friends in this friend group started noticing that this guy had gone missing. And so now Fritz Harmon has to work overtime trying to convince all the friends in this group not to report him missing. And it worked. This man was never reported missing. And so nothing was ever traced back to Fritz Harmon obviously until years later. And now that Harmon was back in his groove, he was killing more frequently again. Over the next three months, he claimed seven more victims. The youngest of which of these seven victims was actually 10 years old, his youngest victim yet. And then finally, in June of 1924, Fritz Harmon committed what would be his final murder his 27th, and that was of a 17 year old boy named Eric. Carmen even remarked how it took him four separate trips to the river to be able to dispose of all of this boy's body. Four separate trips, and he carried all of these dismembered body parts in a bag that had belonged to a different one of his murder victims. In fact, I think I got a little bit wrong there. He had actually moved house just before his last murder. So he didn't actually dispose of this last victim's body parts in that same river. This time he disposed of them in a nearby lake. However, Fritz Harmon was blissfully unaware that back at that old river where he used to live, the body parts had started washing up and he had no idea. Over the last month or so, the local kids that lived nearby that river, they would all go and play in there in the summer, go and swim and splash about. And they had been finding human skulls washing up on the riverbank, multiple. And at first, when they started reporting this to the police and handing them in to the police station, they didn't think it was quite so sinister at first. Initially, when it was just like one, two, maybe three skulls, police thought that these were maybe just victims of drowning. People that had fallen into that river, couldn't swim, died, and now their body parts are washing up. But as more and more skulls seem to be appearing on the riverbanks, they're thinking, 
there's no way this many people drowned in such a short space of time. So they sent these skulls off to a lab to be forensically examined. And as soon as the pathologist took one look at these skulls, they knew that they weren't there from natural causes. There's absolutely no way. Because where the skull would have connected to like the neck bones, it had been perfectly severed with a sharp knife. There ain't nothing natural about that. It wasn't like it was a natural crack or a breakage or something that would happen over time as this body decayed in the river. This had been an intentional decapitation. Well, multiple. Every single one of these skulls was cut the same way. And they also managed to determine that a lot of these skulls, well, all of the skulls, were from young boys or young men. Little boys' decapitated heads are washing up on these riverbanks and other young boys that are playing in this river are finding them. It genuinely sounds like something out of a horror film. So now police are starting to think that they've got a potential serial killer on their hands. And so they launched this full scale investigation, starting by making sure that they'd got every single piece of evidence out of that river that they possibly could. And this actually took a little bit longer than you would expect because obviously in the early 1900s, they didn't quite have like forensic diving teams like we have now. Instead, it was just kind of a bunch of locals and neighbors and volunteers just jumping in the river and swimming about, wafting their hands about to see if they could find all. And over the next few weeks, with the help from all these neighbors and volunteers, they managed to fish out over 500 different pieces of bones. And again, a lot of them had the same sharp knife marks, like where they'd been cut from each other. And again, all of these bones seemed to be from young boys, young men. And so they had a very clear victim type here for this potential serial killer. So as they're starting to think of potential suspects, who could have done this to all these young boys? There was one name that sprung to mind immediately. Obviously, known sexual predator, Fritz Harmon. Yes, he'd gotten away with a lot of his sexual crimes against young boys over the years because of his good relationship with the police, but that didn't mean that they didn't know that he was doing them. They did. They knew what kind of guy he was. They knew that he was a rapist. They knew that he sexually abused and lured these kids away. They didn't know that he was murdering them just yet, but now they did. So straight away, police put Fritz Harmon on 24 hour police surveillance. They were watching his every move. And literally within a couple of days of being on surveillance, he was back at Hanover train station trying to find his next victim. Police watched him approach this 15 year old boy named Kurt and the two of them spoke briefly for a second and then all of a sudden started shouting at each other, just started arguing in the middle of this train station. Of course, Harmon had no idea that he was being watched at this point in time and police saw an opportunity here because they wanted to arrest Fritz Harmon but they needed to wait for him to do something. And now he was being aggressive in public. So they had an excuse. They stepped in and arrested both him and this 15 year old boy. So they took both of them back to the police station and questioned them separately. And as they were speaking to this 15 year old boy, they realized that this actually hadn't been the first time that Kurt and Fritz Harmon had met because Kurt proceeded to tell them that he had been abused by Harmon for days, for like four days at this point. And that him at the train station was actually him trying to run away from Fritz Harmon. He'd gotten to the train station and then somehow Harmon had come and found him and was trying to take him back. That's how they got into this argument. Kurt told them that for the last four days, he'd been locked away in Fritz Harmon's apartment and repeatedly raped at knife point. And of course, now he'd managed to escape and luckily he was safe in police custody. So police officially arrested Fritz Harmon for this specific case of him abusing this 15 year old boy. And this gave them an excuse to go and search his house. And as soon as they stepped foot inside that apartment, they knew they had their guy because every single wall, floor, all the bedding, everything was stained, heavily stained with blood. Just a side note, they did ask him in his questioning why this was, why there was blood staining all over his apartment. And Fritz Harmon proceeded to tell them that he was a butcher, not just any butcher, a work from home butcher. Do they even exist? Does anyone do that? He said that he would bring these animals back into his apartment, kill them there and chop them up 
Just, just on his bed? What? Why is your bed covered in blood? You're killing a pig on your bed. Of course, that's not true. No one believed that at all. But anyway, the search of the apartment continued and police are just rummaging through everything and they find a lot of young men's and young boys' clothes. Just a lot of items that definitely would not fit Fritz Harmon. And they knew what this meant. They knew that these had to be victim's clothes. And so police put out an announcement for anyone that had a missing son or a missing brother to come down to this apartment and look through all of these clothes and see if they could identify any of them. See if they could connect their own missing loved one to Fritz Harmon. And this worked. Quite a lot of Fritz Harmon's victims were identified through this method. And actually there was one woman who came down, I think her son was missing. She looked through all these clothes and none of them belonged to her son. So she turned to leave the apartment, feeling quite defeated with no answers at all. And when she did, she spotted the landlady and her son standing in the doorway. And her son was wearing her son's jacket, her missing son's jacket. And that was how one of the victims was identified because the clothes that he was wearing when he was murdered had now been somehow passed along to different people that never even knew of her son. So yeah, as a lot of these victims were being identified, police obviously still at the apartment decided to go and question a lot of Fritz Harmon's neighbors to see if they'd seen or heard anything while they'd been living by him. And a lot of them confirmed that Fritz Harmon would have a lot of young boys and young men over. They would see these boys coming in and out of the apartment. And actually a few of them had seen these young boys and men leaving the apartment in the early hours of the morning or like late at night with concealed sacks and bags and baskets along with Fritz Harmon. And police theorized that this was Harmon getting his next victims to help him dispose of the last victim's bodies in the river. How horrifying is that? I wonder if those boys that would help him carry those body parts out to the river, I wonder if they knew what they were carrying. Anyway, back at the police station, they obviously had Fritz Harmon sat down in the interrogation room and they basically said to him, look, the jig's up, we know you're a serial killer and he couldn't argue with the facts. So the now 44 year old Fritz Harmon sat there and confessed to 20 cases of raping, murdering, and dismembering these young boys. Even describing it as a rabid sexual passion of his, which is vile. And as he went on to talk about this quite openly with police, they could tell that he didn't really see what was so horrifyingly wrong with what he'd done. He wasn't embarrassed or shameful or guilty or remorseful. In fact, he described it as a rabid sexual passion of his. How can you describe murder as a passion of yours? Like it's a hobby. He would say that he was sexually intoxicated by these boys. Actually, he would call his victims his doll boys. And actually he did go on to tell police that he'd had one surviving victim. He brought this boy back to his house, raped him, and then tried to murder him, again, by biting out his Adam's apple. But somehow this boy wrestled him off and escaped from his house and ran away. And actually police never heard directly from this boy. They have no idea who this victim is. They've never identified him, possibly because he was too scared to go to the police about this. So police continued to question him about like the whole process, you know, each process of how he would lure them in and then how he would rape them and then murder them and then dismember them. And Harmon told them that it was actually the dismemberment part that he hated. He enjoyed every other aspect of, of raping and murdering these young boys, but the dismemberment process was borderline traumatic for him actually. He said that he knew that that was kind of the only way that he could get rid of these bodies properly. And so he just had to put up with it, but it would actually make him physically sick, physically ill, every single time. In fact, after the first murder that he committed, he couldn't get out of bed for like eight days because he was physically ill and he was so traumatized by what he'd seen and what he'd done that it really, really affected him. And for this exact reason, each dismemberment would actually take him a couple of days to complete where other murderers can usually get it done in like a few hours, maybe like six hours, 12 hours. It would take him days at a time because he would have to keep giving himself breaks and he would like have to run away to 
go and be sick. But he told the police that he would put up with it because his love and passion for the murder part of the process was stronger than the horror of the cutting and the chopping. Just a little bit of a warning here. For the next couple of minutes of this video, I'm about to tell you the exact process of how he would dismember these bodies. And it is very graphic. So if you don't like descriptions of gore, you can skip to this time, I'll make Editor Jack get you a timestamp. So he said that the first thing he would do once he'd murdered his victim, he would lay them out and first he would cut open their torso, their abdomen, and remove all of their innards. So that's their intestines, their organs, the heart, all, all the mushy stuff inside. And he would just throw it all in a bucket. And then he would pack the inside of their torso with a load of rags to just soak up all the excess blood. And then he would try and break as many bones in the torso as he possibly could. So like the ribs and the and the shoulder bones and everything, just to make it easier to, to chop them up. He would then dismember the arms and legs. I think he would cut them into like two pieces each. So forearm, the top of the arm, so then that's four pieces of arms, four pieces of legs. He would throw them into the bucket. He would then go on to skinning the torso. So he would just like cut chunks of flesh off it, throw all that in the bucket too. And then the final step would be the decapitation. Once the rest of the body was taken care of, he would then just have the head and he would move on to well, whatever he did with the head, he would start skinning that as well, cutting chunks of flesh off until he was down to the skull. And then he would grab an ax or any other like heavy object that he had with him. And he would just bash at this skull to try and break it so that he could get into the brain. Once he was done with this whole dismemberment process, he would package all these different body parts up into bags and sacks and all that kind of stuff. And then he would take them to the river and just throw them in. So police asked him just how many victims they should be looking for here, and Fritz Harmon told them that he'd killed anywhere between 50 and 70 young boys over the years. Although, like I said, they only found evidence for 27 of those. He ended up only being charged for 24 of those 27. I'm not entirely sure why. And then Hans Granz was also charged with being an accessory to murder. Both of the men were found guilty of their crimes and actually both of them were sentenced to death. Both of them were to be beheaded. And Fritz Harmon, obviously, I think he knew that this was coming. As soon as he was caught, he knew that he was gonna be executed. And so he took it rather well, whereas Hans Granz was just a wreck. I think he like collapsed then and there in the sentencing. Hans Granz actually tried to appeal his death sentence and that appeal was rejected. They were like, nah, you're being executed for this. That was until his father turned up at the police station one day because he'd been given a letter from an anonymous messenger. And this letter was supposedly from Fritz Harmon. He'd somehow managed to write this letter in prison. This letter was four pages long in total and professed that Hans Granz was actually innocent. And Harmon said it was all him. Hans Granz had nothing to do with any of it. And that the punishment that he was being given an execution was completely unjust. The letter supposedly says that Fritz Harmon had just implicated Hans Granz in all of his own murders because he was mad at Hans Granz because of their turbulent relationship. Like I said, it was quite an abusive relationship. Hans Granz was verbally abusive. He was quite mean to Fritz Harmon. And so this was what, like an act of revenge, trying to get him implicated in the crime so that he would be executed. So yeah, this letter was a thing. And I mean, I personally, based on what sources say, I kind of doubt that this letter was authentic. I mean, look where it came from. An anonymous messenger gave this letter to Hans Grand's father, his own father, who obviously doesn't want his son to die, doesn't want his son to be executed. He took it to the police station and he's like, look, this is from Fritz Harmon, it's all true. I don't know, where did that messenger even get the letter from? Obviously not from Fritz Harmon directly in prison. So there's, there's actually no credibility for this letter at all, as far as I'm aware. But for some reason it's just believed. 
I don't know, everyone just kind of went, oh, all right, yeah, okay. I don't know, it just seems very uh, convenient to me. And also remember, throughout this whole case, there's a lot of witness testimonies that do actually implicate Hans Granz that are not just Fritz Harman's. So like there were witnesses at the train station that literally saw Hans Granz and Fritz Harman pointing at that boy Adolf before they kidnapped him. And remember what his girlfriend said right around the, was it the first murder when he told her that the boy was gonna get trampled on tonight? I don't know, to me, it it seems that Hans Granz wasn't innocent. He was an accessory to murder based on witness testimonies, based on evidence. But for some reason, this letter happened with no credibility and suddenly police are like, oh, okay, I guess he's not guilty then. So yeah, because of this random unverified letter, his death sentence was overturned and instead he just served 12 years in prison for what he did. But anyway, Fritz Harman's execution did go ahead as planned on April 15th, 1925. The night before his execution, he was granted a cigar and a Brazilian coffee in his cell, which is literally one of the worst death row meals I have ever heard of in my entire life, but whatever. But yeah, that is all I have on this case. Thank you so, so much for watching. And thanks again to NordPass for sponsoring this video. Remember they have an exclusive deal for you guys, plus an additional month free when you go through the link down below in the description. That's nordpass.com forward slash Eleanor and use code Eleanor at checkout. A huge thank you to all of my channel members for supporting the channel and helping me decide the cases that I cover. All of my tier two members are on screen right now. So thank you so much. If you want to become a channel member, you can click the join button down below. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed, please leave a thumbs up and I'll leave you another video here if you want to watch another one. Or if you want to subscribe to my channel, you can click this circle right here. Okay, I'll see you in the next one. Bye.